and timely debt relief to countries, including under the common framework for debt treatment, where progress has been too slow. As a second priority area, we remain committed to extensive and strategic multilateral action in response to Russia's war on Ukraine. The price cap and sanctions, both the result of unprecedented global collaboration, are having powerful impacts on Russia's ability to wage its brutal and unjust war. We also remain committed to support for Ukraine and recently put forward a supplemental funding request. There's been bipartisan support for this funding to date, and it's critical that we continue to provide timely economic assistance. During my visit to Kyiv earlier this year, I saw firsthand the importance of this assistance in enabling Ukraine's resistance on the front lines. We're also grateful for the involvement of our partners, including the 50 billion euro package proposed by the European Union and the $15 billion International Monetary Fund program, which has been essential to Ukraine's efforts to implement reforms and stabilize the economy. And we need to remain focused on addressing the devastating consequences of the war, including its impact on food security. Russia's withdrawal from the Black Sea Grain Initiative is deeply concerning and is particularly being felt by low- and middle-income countries. In response, we hope to move forward on efforts such as supporting the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program and working toward a successful replenishment of the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Last but not least, continuing to advance the U.S.-India relationship will be a priority this week. We highly value our bilateral relationship with India. In fact, this is my fourth time in India over the last year, making it the country I visited most frequently as Treasury Secretary. We also welcome Prime Minister Modi to the U.S. in June. The U.S. is home to the largest Indian diaspora outside of Asia and is India's largest export market. Expanding our bilateral economic ties and our cooperation on global challenges is crucially important to us. And let me stop there, and with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, the World Bank, among others, has also expressed concern about a period of higher interest rates and slower global, global growth. I'm curious for what you're hearing from other countries about the risks to global growth and how that's shaping all the priorities that you just outlined. So um, certainly we're aware of the risk to global growth. Um, I would say the most important negative influence is Russia's war on Ukraine, which has escalated energy and food prices. And as has many at G20 meetings have stated repeated, repeatedly, the most important thing we could do for global growth is for Russia to end its brutal war on Ukraine. That said, um, I think I've personally been surprised by the strength of global growth and how resilient the global economy has proven to be. And recently, the IMF has somewhat um, improved its economic projections. But many countries have built important buffers which have enabled them to weather um, very significant shocks to the global economy. And while there are are risks in some countries that have been, um, certainly have been affected. Overall, the global economy has been resilient. And as you know, the United States has done particularly well. Uh, Victoria? Um, I, as a, just a follow-up, how concerned are you about the Chinese slowdown, or how does it affect your outlook for the global, well, how does it affect your 
global growth outlook. And also, just on Ukraine, you talked about U.S. support. I was just wondering, especially on the supplemental funding request, if you're at all concerned about having difficulty getting this through Congress, given negotiations over government funding. And, yeah, thank you. So, um, with respect to China, China um, faces a variety of both short and longer-term global challenges, uh, economic challenges that we've been monitoring carefully, including less of a pickup in consumer spending than um, had been anticipated in the aftermath of um, the COVID restrictions, as well as longstanding issues with respect to um, the property sector and um, debt, debt um, related to that. And longer term, of course, um, population growth is um, now turned negative and the labor force is beginning to shrink. Um, so um, see China's growth as slowing over time. That said, China has quite a bit of policy space to address these challenges. So we're monitoring the situation. Um, I don't see it as having um, very significant direct impact on the United States. Um, some countries in East Asia are more likely to be um, affe affected by the slowdown, but it's something that we are keeping an eye on. With respect to the supplemental, I'm pleased that there has been um, bipartisan support um, in both houses of Congress um, for Ukraine, and I feel confident that um, we'll be able to um, make sure that we have funding. Uh, we continue to stand behind Ukraine um, for as long as is necessary. Uh, two things. Uh, first, the absence of President Xi and Putin this weekend and how that might reshape the meetings or potentially uh, affect the utility of the G20 going forward if these two leaders in their, at the highest levels aren't here. Uh, also curious if you have any comment um, on the apparent reports out of China that they're banning the use of iPhones by government workers uh, or further restricting them um, for, for whatever reason, similar to how we've banned TikTok and Huawei, uh, would that have any effects more broadly on this sort of ongoing back and forth over U.S. and Chinese technology, and how could that affect the global economy? Well, let me start with your first question pertaining to the absence of um, Xi and Putin. Um, I, I think it's important to emphasize that the G20 is a prime um, contributor to um, the solution of global challenges. We see it as the premier um, organization um, that on a global basis is taking on critical challenges facing the global economy and particularly the global south. And I believe the G20, um, in spite of obvious problems due to the due to Russia's war against Ukraine and Russia's um, you know general absence from G20 um, initiatives, I believe the G20 has been extremely effective and um, especially under India's leadership, um, our goals for the G20 have coincided closely. Um, with those of India, we have tackled very important challenges. As I mentioned, I think we have had considerable success in changing the way the entire multilateral development system is operating, um, increasing its mission um, to take on a variety of global challenges, ranging from better preparedness for future pandemics, um, where we've established a new finance and health minister's task force, a fund, a pandemic fund at the World Bank, um, as well as climate change, um, taking on global challenges along with poverty reduction. Um, we've made over the last year very substantial progress in 
um, changing not only the mission, but also improving the financial resources of the multilateral development banks um, to perform their critical missions and changing the incentives and structures under which they operate. And um, I, I think that's been an extremely effective initiative um, under India's leadership. Uh, debt has been in international debt and providing relief to uh, countries that are over indebted, um, partly because of the impact of Russia's war against Ukraine, but also the high interest rate environment. Um, I begin, believe we're beginning to make significant progress there. So I do see the G20 as a very effective forum. We appreciate India's leadership. Um, we look forward ourselves to hosting the G20 in 2026, and um, even without Russia's um, active participation uh, in the tensions the war has created, um, I still see the G20 is highly effective. And China potentially you know, withholding access to iPhones? Oh. On iPhone, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm not aware of um, what's involved in that. I'm not. I'm not really prepared to give you an answer on that. James, uh, thank you, Secretary Yellen. Um, how soon are you expecting other U.S. allies and partners to join your plan for the World Bank with specific pledges? Um, and will the scale of this be sufficient uh, to really reduce the dependence of emerging economies on? Uh, lending from China, which your administration has described as coercive? Well, we certainly seek with our G20 partners to um, enhance the financial capacity of the World Bank and the MDB system more generally. And um, the reforms that are underway, as I indicated, could lead over the next decade to an additional $200 billion. Um, in addition, we're looking forward to um, discussing the possibility of other cap putting in place other capital adequacy framework rec recommendations like um, adding callable capital that could further increase the resources. But um, President Biden has um, asked Congress to provide an additional two and a quarter billion dollars to the World Bank, um, an initiative that is designed to show our commitment to relieving um, global uh, problems of the South, taking on uh, global issues like climate change and pandemic preparedness, and those resources can lead to around an additional $25 billion, just the U.S. contribution to lending ability of the World Bank. Um, they would go toward um, additional funds for IDA to make um, very low-cost subsidized loans to the most challenged low-income countries, as well as, conce as concessional finance uh, to attack global uh, problems. And we have asked other countries to join with us um, to the extent that they're able to, in this initiative, we are hopeful that other countries, um, depending on their financial um, capacity, will join us and we can scale that up. In addition, with respect to the IMF, the supplemental uh, calls for um, an additional $25 billion um, loan um, from the U.S. to the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust at the IMF that would be um, further concessional finance um, for low-income countries. So these are important initiatives um, doing what we can, and it's not just a question of responding to China. It's a question of addressing to long-standing global challenges, reducing poverty, addressing um, global global public goods issues, that this is, this is a critically important mission. Thank you. Secretary, do you think that the G20 will be able to reach agreement on a communique, and specifically on uh, the war in Ukraine as part of that? 
So I understand that this is challenging to craft such language, but I know the negotiators are discussing it and working hard to do so, and um, we stand ready certainly to work with India to try to craft a communique that successfully um, addresses this concern. by using fewer uh, Western uh, insurance services and ships, and in fact the, the price of Russian oil is, has climbed in some cases above the price cap. Are you worried that your Russia policy is becoming more difficult to effectively implement? So m my perception is that the price cap continues to work. It had two goals. One was to cut Russia's revenues, and our estimate is that Russia's revenue from oil has declined by around 44 percent over the last year. The second goal was to keep the global market well supplied, and Russia's um, exports and sales into the global market have uh, continued and have not significantly contracted. Now, um, uh, the ban applies to services, um, the, so the $60 price cap applies to any oil sold using services from members of the coalition. And um, although there is, uh, there are sales that are permitted under the price cap, as you mentioned, that do not use Western services, and many of those are occurring at prices above $60. Um, they're not a violation of the price cap, and it is very expensive for Russia and other countries to provide services where Western providers have clear um, price advantages. And so while such things are occurring, it erodes the revenue that Russia is able to receive on net from those sales. And um, certainly there are substantial sales that are occurring as well using Western services, and um, as far as we can tell, and we're certainly monitoring for evasion of the sanctions, um, these sales are occurring below the $60 price cap. So I do believe it continues to work. <laughs> 